Chapter 18, Section 3, The Great Debate About Ratification. Two days after President Wilson returned home, he called on the Senate to ratify the Treaty of Versailles with U.S. membership in the League of Nations. Wilson had strong public support. More than 30 state legislatures and governors endorsed League membership. Still, Wilson had yet to win the necessary two-thirds of the Senate needed to ratify a treaty. The question was whether he could get enough Republican votes in the Senate to reach that magic number. Reservationists seek changes before approving treaty. Many Republicans in the Senate were reluctant to approve the treaty as it was written. Known as reservationists, they said they would vote yes, but only with a number of reservations or changes added to it. The reservationists were mostly concerned with Article 10 of the League's charter. This article focused on collective security. It required member nations to work together and even supply troops to keep the peace. Reservationists feared this would draw the United States into wars without approval from Congress. They demanded that Article 10 be changed to read, The United States assumes no obligations to preserve the territorial integrity or political independence of any other country, unless Congress shall so provide. Republican Senator Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts was the leader of the reservationists. In a speech outlining his views, he warned, The United States is the world's best hope, but if you fetter her in the interests and quarrels of other nations, if you tangle her in the intrigues of Europe, you will destroy her power for good and endanger her very existence. Strong, generous, and confident, she has nobly served mankind. Beware how you trifle with your marvelous inheritance, this great land of ordered liberty, for if we stumble and fall, freedom and civilization everywhere will go down in ruin. Henry Cabot Lodge on the League of Nations, August 12, 1919. Lodge had both personal and political reasons for opposing the Treaty of Versailles. He and Wilson had long been bitter foes. I never expected to hate anyone in politics with the hatred I feel toward Wilson, Lodge once confessed. He was also angry that Wilson had snubbed Republicans when choosing delegates to the peace conference. The ratification debate gave Lodge and his fellow Republicans an opportunity to embarrass the president and weaken the Democratic Party. As head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Lodge found ways to delay action on the treaty. When the treaty came to his committee for study, he spent two weeks reading aloud every word of the nearly 300 pages. Next, he held six weeks of public hearings, during which opponents of the treaty were given ample time to speak out against it. Irreconcilables reject the treaty in any form. A group of 16 Senate Republicans firmly opposed the Treaty of Versailles. Known as irreconcilables, their no vote was certain. They were completely opposed to any treaty that included an international organization that might draw the nation into war. Republican Senator William Borah of Idaho was one of the more outspoken irreconcilables. The world, he declared, could get along better without our intervention. He scoffed at reservationist position. Recalling George Washington's farewell address, he asked, where is the reservation which protects us against entangling alliances with Europe? Internationalists support the Treaty of Versailles. Most Senate Democrats strongly supported the treaty. This group, known as internationalists, believed that greater cooperation among nations could work for the benefit of all. They argued that the United States had already become a major world power. As such, it should take its rightful place in the world community by becoming a member of the League of Nations. Rather than worry about the United States being dragged into another war by the League, the internationalists focus on the League's role in keeping the peace. President Wilson takes his case to the people. As the ratification hearings dragged on, the public began to lose interest. Upset by Lodge's delaying tactics, Wilson decided to go directly to the public for support. On learning the president was planning a speaking tour of the country, his doctors warned that it could damage his already failing health. Wilson is reported to have replied, My own health is not to be considered when the future peace and security of the world are at stake. If the treaty is not ratified by the Senate, the war will have been fought in vain and the world will be thrown into chaos. I promise our soldiers, when I ask them to take up arms, that it was a war to end wars. Woodrow Wilson, August 27, 1919. The president embarked on a grueling 8,000-mile speaking tour of the West. He spoke up to four times a day, giving about 40 speeches in 29 cities. Two irreconcilables, Bora and California Senator Hiram Johnson, followed Wilson on their own tour. Despite their attacks, the campaign for the treaty seemed to be picking up speed when disaster struck. On September 25, 1919, 
The president collapsed with a severe headache in Pueblo, Colorado. His doctor stopped the tour, and Wilson's train sped back to Washington.